or it's up to you. Okay. Thank you. It is your decision. How do you define classroom community? That is up to you. What I'm going to do, since it's now 1.30, is I'm going to start the recording and say what we're doing, and then we'll keep going. And we are already recording, I thought we were not, but that's great. Let's give it about one more minute. Wonderful. So if you take a look at what we've shared, you'll see that the words that are the largest are the ones that the majority of us feel are ways that we define classroom community. And so what we're gonna be doing today is talking about ways to build classroom community, support classroom community, maintain classroom community and enhance it over the course of a semester. So the title of our presentation is from solo learning to team building, or from solo to learning team, building community in the classroom. And so we're gonna do one more poll because this will help inform what we're gonna talk about. It's called a Slido poll. And the question in the Slido poll is, what is your biggest challenge to building community in your classroom? And so it's slightly different from a poll everywhere. The first thing you did was a process called poll everywhere. The one that we're gonna do now is very similar. And it's also a neat little trick that we're gonna talk about a little bit more because we're gonna share these tools out. So what you're going to do is you can either click this QR code or you can join by going to slido.com and tap, typing in 10722. And then you're going to answer this question. And this is an open type. So instead of a word bubble, as you type your answer in, your whole answer is going to appear on the screen. What is your biggest challenge to building community in your classroom? Ooh, pandemic.
and participation, that's also a big one. And we're gonna be talking about both of those. Attendance, okay, definitely. Masks, okay. Apathy and phones, interesting. Zoom fatigue and sensitive stomachs, stomachs, ha, subjects. Not being prepared, yes. Ooh, scared to be vulnerable, okay. Hmm, Zoom format, webcams off, all right. Students intimidated by content, okay. Not accustomed to active learning and participation, all right. Large classes, not interested. Ah, pandemic related absence, yes. Okay, fear of judgment, time limits. Fear of rejection, fear of being judged. Content overload. Lack of student interest. Oh, quarantine uncertainty, also good. These are all wonderful answers. And so as we think about what we're, ooh, different levels of knowledge, real or perceived, very interesting. As we go through our presentation today, we're going to keep all of these elements in mind. And hopefully what we talk about will help format ways to overcome some of these issues and develop approaches to building community in the classroom that work around all of these issues. So here's our, here's our plan of action. We're gonna begin by talking about how to begin building community on the very first day of class. Then we're gonna look at taking that and strengthening it during the first very first few weeks of class and then sustaining it across the entire semester. And then we're gonna leave some time at the end to talk as a group about things that you've done things that you would like to do, things that have not worked well in your own formats and ways that we might be able to get around that. If you had the opportunity yesterday to attend the presentation called Planning for the First Day for, Planning the First Day for Students by Jesmyn, Cynthia, Elizabeth, and Genevieve, it was a fantastic presentation on the very first day. If you did not have a chance to can you see what I'm doing? I'm not even sure you can see. I'm sorry, here I am talking. You can't see it yet. Let me share that. There we go. So there was a wonderful presentation yesterday, January 6th, um, by Jasmine Actor, Cynthia Morgan, Elizabeth Schoenfield, and Genevieve Elsher called Planning the First Day for Students. Um, it's based on material by a Q. There's a large Q workshop that's going on. It's a, uh, a year long uh, process. And all four of these people and a number of other people are going through it. It's, it was a terrific workshop. If you didn't have a chance to attend it, that's okay. It was recorded just like this one is being recorded. It will be housed in the Teaching Center Professional Development Library for spring 2022. Those recordings should be available beginning the middle of this month. So you can go back and watch it. And one of the things that they talked about was ways to begin building community from day one in the classroom. And so there were a set of strategies that they discussed, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on those because they did a wonderful job of unpacking them. But briefly, some of the things that they talked about, and, and not everyone can do every single one of these with every one of these classes of their classes. So this is just a menu of things that you can pull from. For some people, they can stand at the door and as their students are coming in or if they're on Zoom, as their students are logging in, they can actually personally greet each student as they come into the instructional space. That works for some people. It doesn't work for others. That is one possible option. Another one that everyone is familiar with are, um, is icebreakers. Some people really like icebreakers. We had someone yesterday who said when they hear the word icebreaker, they hide under the table. Um, but there are a wide variety of things you can do as an icebreaker from partner up, learn about your partner, introduce your partner to um, what is something about the course that you're interested in learning about, 
to if you're in a large group, a large room of students, you have a small amount of time. As a group, come up with three things that you want to know about the course and one person present it. They're all types of icebreakers. Um, a really important one could be create a welcome message for the course and post it in your shell, your syllabus, and send it out as an email prior to the beginning of the semester. Another one is to allow students to post anonymous questions. You can do it physically in a classroom where you give them post-it notes and they write it down and post it on a wall. Or you could do something like what we just did with Poll Everywhere, which is the first one, or Slido, which is the second one, where they can go in and type and people do not know who is actually posting it. A really good one is for faculty to do a personal introduction so that all of the students begin to get to know you. If you are in a Zoom or a web format, you can create an online introduction discussion board where they can introduce themselves and then interact with their classmates. And the last one, a syllabus reconnaissance. Um, Jasmine et al. Um, talk more about this. This is a neat tool where instead of standing up there the first day and reading the entire syllabus, you put students into a group. The group reviews the syllabus, finds certain pieces of information, and then also comes back and talks to the class about the pieces that were most relevant to them. Again, it's a group-based activity that gets them working in teams and begins to build that sense of community. And one of the, as we talk about this, one of the reasons that that sense of community is so important, and one of the things that the teaching center has been talking about for now a year and a half, is this whole concept of culturally relevant teaching practices. Because as you all know, our students don't come to us as empty vessels. They bring in their own languages and their own cultures and their own prior experiences and their life experience. And part of the things that we can do, and this also addresses equity, is to leverage all of that wonderful background knowledge that they bring to our classes in order to make their experience with our content richer and our experience working with them more fulfilling. And so all of this, as we talk about building community, is leveraging what they know as they come into the content and they as a group interact with it and we interact with them. And that also helps address the equity issue that we've been talking about as an entire campus. So then I'm gonna turn this over to Robert. So uh, I wanted to use this as a personal example because this is what I do, I've started to do in my classes since uh, I've also been part of AQ. Um, because I'm also one of those people that, uh, although I've, I've been told I don't seem that way, but I'm pretty introverted. And the idea of doing an icebreaker with a room full of students uh, does not intrigue me. It's not, it's not on my to-do list. It's not my preferred way to go about it. Uh, so I struggled with this particular section of AQ. And so part of the logic for why we use Poll Everywhere and Slido at the beginning of this is to model some of the alternative ways that we can take some of these principles and really adapt it to our own courses. Uh, one of the things I hear a lot is there are too many students, right? It's not, it's not feasible to do introductions. And that's probably true. I have some classes that are that way for myself. Um, but those things like Slido provide a way to get all the students involved in a thing like a syllabus reconnaissance without having to talk to every single student at this uh, individually. So it cuts down on the time you need and it still allows you to have that kind of activity. So the reason I included this here is because I didn't use a single one of these techniques. I actually blended these four techniques together to do something that I was comfortable with. Uh, and it worked out pretty well. Um, I didn't have a, uh, so I took this idea of an icebreaker, a welcome message, a personal introduction, and a syllabus reconnaissance, and I created my own uh, first day procedure. And that is, when I wrote my syllabus, I included my personal introduction and welcome message in the syllabus. So it gave me time to type it and construct it and make it say exactly what I wanted to say, which I was much more comfortable with than uh, trying to play an icebreaker game at the beginning of class. Uh, when I gave that syllabus to my students, I had them do a syllabus reconnaissance too. Um, but so as they're reading this syllabus, they are getting my welcome message and they are getting my personal introduction. I asked each one of my students to craft 
uh, an independent question, so not as groups, by themselves, each person, one question about that they had about the syllabus. And they had the option to ask me one personal question too, if they wanted to. So I got to learn their names and everyone got to hear someone ask a question about the syllabus. Some of those questions were redundant, but what that also did was allow students to realize they weren't alone. Um, this to me led to a much more fruitful discussion. It led to a lot of questions. It showed me places where students were confused and it allowed me to get that confusion out of the way right there on day one. So as we present these things, please don't take them as prescriptive or if you're in AQ, please don't take them as prescriptive. There are ways to, to make it work even if these particular things aren't necessarily up your alley like they are mine. Um, so when we move through this idea of strengthening that community during class, uh, after seeing the presentation before, um, we realized that we needed to shift our position a little bit. They covered some of the stuff we were going to cover so well, we needed to stretch it out into not just the first day, but maybe the first week and then into the semester. Um, so some of the things that I've started doing is uh, using early in-class non-graded assignments. Um, this allows me to assess students and give them an early data point um, for where they actually are in the class. And it helps show, not just convince them, but demonstrate to them the gap in knowledge from where they think they are to where they need to be. Um, and this al allows for a lot more cooperative assessment practice, something that we can, I continue throughout the semester and that they get better at, which is helping each other. Um, you know, it also helps us gauge the students' readiness for learning, and it ensures that assignments and activities prepare the students and materials uh, for the future. So one of the things that we're, I'm going to be talking about, too, is this idea of an interest stimulator, how we use short, um, small group activities to build that sense of community before we go into the main lesson of my class, and how I use that to create interest in the material and to introduce new content by leveraging their previous knowledge, stuff they already know and like. Um, and in that way, it encourages student to student support and it allows them to create a buddy system, something that Mary Liz is, Elizabeth is gonna to touch on a bit later is a, a cool new thing that we both learned about called Group Me that also helps with that too. Okay, so we're both gonna talk about some of the interest stimulator ideas and um, one of the things we've learned as we've been working through the teaching center is that we both come out of the humanities. And when we talk to people who come out of STEM, some of the feedback is that we have to cover so much content that we don't have time to do a whole lot of interactive work within our classes. And so what I wanna show you is a couple of tools that can generate some community, some interaction, and that really do not take much time. So this is one of them. Um, if you're familiar with Kahoot, could you just hit the raise hand button for me, please? If you know the, the structure, the online structure Kahoot, so I've got five. All right, if you're not familiar with Kahoot, this is a wonderful, wonderful online um, interactive game. It's lovely, it's very simple. And um, one of the things that we can do at a later presentation is, um, show you how to use all these tools, Poll Everywhere, Slido, Kahoot, a couple of others that we're gonna talk about. It's very simple. It's an online interactive quiz game. Um, so this is a very short quiz. I teach ESL and I, this is an advanced ESL course. It's an advanced grammar course. Some of um, my native English speakers in I teach reading support as well, probably could not do this very easily. It's a five question interactive quiz. It's like set up like a quiz show. They go in with their phones, they click answers. It shows results. You can play it as a group. You can play it individually. You can play it in teams and it takes a total of five minutes. But it activates their prior knowledge, gets them excited about what you're going to do. You can do it as a knowledge check. You can also do it as a review before a test and it's very, very fast. Something else you could do is something like what you've already seen, the Slido or the Poll Everywhere. I used to teach biology. I was a biology high school teacher. So for example, I love teaching botany. So a botany question might be, um, what types of plants can reproduce asexually? Uh, so I could say something like, what types of um, 
plant roots can undergo uh, vegetative reproduction. And then what they're going to have to do is the same word balloon, well, word cloud, where they're putting the answers up. And then in groups, they're going to decide, is that correct or not? Like you saw, three minutes. And then that leads into the lecture. But it's got them working as a group. You can then put them off in teams. And we're going to talk about a couple of other tools that you can use where you don't actually have to use in-class class time but you're still having them work with each other cooperatively. And this can be completely virtual, does not require a physical presence for it to work. Sorry, I was muted. On, a, on that same but slightly different note, um, we, I, with Kahoot, that's a pretty low stakes way of getting students engaged with the material. And I'm a really big uh, 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 fan of the idea of formative assessment or low stakes assignments to give students a really good idea of where they are and what's expected of them. So here's an example of something I do in my 1010 course using small groups. Uh, this is the very first assignment we have. I have them uh, write what I call a diagnostic essay and I'm specifically leveraging their own expertise and knowledge. Um, so I first asked them to uh, list something that they love to talk about. You know, if that's sports, if it's superheroes, music, food, does it matter? Um, and to just write that down, something they're very comfortable talking about. And then I asked them to just simply make a claim about it. My, my one here is that Deadpool is the best superhero. I know that might be controversial, even that he's a superhero. But, um, and from there, we start to build an introduction. Once uh, they have uh, written one based on whatever their current knowledge is on how to write an introduction, I have them use over here on the right my stu uh, structural uh, rubric to determine whether they have all of the pieces necessary for an introduction. Um, so all they have to do is go through and highlight one, two, three, four, five. This allows them to immediately see the gaps in their work. I'm missing two and four, or I'm missing three, four, and five. And so from there, we're able to build from that. Right. And this is where the group work and the community comes in because using that early in class assignment, once they've cr uh, corrected whatever structural mistake they have, they have everything they need. I give them an example of the rubric I'm going to use to assess them. Although I will point out this, it is simplified. So if, uh, that would be my one note on this. Um, if you're going to go through the process like I am here, where I'm not looking at the entire piece, but kind of like drafting in each of its steps, um, providing them with the full rubric is actually counterproductive because it's too much information for them at one time. So I provide these simplified rubrics uh, that I think are pretty easy for them to use and utilize in that moment uh, so to improve things that they're actually able to improve in the time they have. Uh, so I get them into small groups and they grade each other using this rubric. Uh, the next step, however, is one that I think is important because again, this is not for a grade, it is just for their own edification to help their editing. We come back together and then I grade them too. And they can see the gap between maybe where they thought they were and where I think they are if I'm assessing them. And this gives them a pretty clear picture on what they need to work on, uh, how close they are to their goals, and how to course adjust if they're not, um, before they've ever received an actual grade that affects them. <clears throat> so that's an example of one of the ways I build community. Uh, I find that once students have created these groups that they work well in, that they like working with these students, they stick with it. They keep working with them and they talk to each other outside of class. And the real goal after that, if we uh, have established that community is to extend it, to make sure that it grows. Uh, I know that this is uh, apparently a controversial topic. One of the things I really do think helps is leveraging online discussions, regardless of if you're an on-ground class, uh, a virtual class or a fully online class. I still use online discussions in every single class I teach, even if it's on ground, um, because it allows that the, the class to continue in very specific ways. And I do have an example a little bit later. Some other ways to do that though, uh, uh, 
Mary Elizabeth is going to be talking about Flipgrid and GroupMe. I'm going to be talking about the discussion board. Um, we also encourage participation through UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning. If anyone would like a Universal Design for Learning cor uh, course shell, uh, we have one through the Teaching Center. It's empty. It's free. All you got to do is upload the cartridge and it uh, builds it out all the way through all 15 weeks. Um, but what it does, it allows you to gauge online interests, provides clear guidelines, gives clear rubrics, and in all ways is using this idea of transparency, which we already know from TILT. And it eliminates that equity gap for students who are not familiar with how college works because everything is listed out step by step. So one of the things I like to use the discussion board as Robert does as well. And one of the things that I do and he does is goes way back about 40 years ago, began about 40 years ago, which is called writing across the curriculum. And when we say writing across the curriculum, this applies to all disciplines where you're taking your content and you're looping in um, the critical thinking writing skills with it. So for example, as an ESL teacher, some of what I teach as, it, as this example shows, this is from that advanced grammar course. When people think about grammar, they sometimes think about the old fashioned sentence diagramming piece, but grammar is not divorced from reading, writing, language learning. So in the grammar course, it includes um, using a discussion board to write and talk to peers, um, writing actual text and this, which is a way of building community. And this particular, I began particularly using this during the um, complete virtual phase and I liked it so much I continued using it. Flipgrid is an online video platform that allows students to interact as community, but in delayed time. So what's do, it's like a discussion board, but it's a video discussion board. So you provide a prompt as you would with a regular discussion board. In this case, this is the very first prompt that I use in my class. I'm leveraging their prior knowledge. In this case, I'm asking them to describe their experiences as student learning English, uh, previous learning environments in the US or another country because some of our multilingual students did all of their schooling in this country in a primary or secondary school in college and in or outside the classroom, describe your recent efforts and your future plans. I give them the grammar structures to use. They have five minutes to record. Then they get to go into this program, record a video, edit it. They can add emojis. They can add backgrounds. If they are nervous about having their face on the screen, they can use an avatar. They can play with it just like they would have a discussion board and produce a short video that they really feel good about using the language post it, and then just as in a discussion board where you have a response phase, in Flipgrid, you also have a response phase where you post a response to a video. And it starts that conversation through video. And then just like a discussion board, for transparency purposes, I have a rubric. And this is the rubric that's built out in D2L. And so students upload the link to the Flipgrid video to the discussion board in D2L so that from the discussion board, I can click that link and go to their Flipgrid. And then this is the rubric in the discussion board that I use to grade the Flipgrid. And because this is the very first one, it's a 10 point discussion board grade. The, the top part of the rubric is, applies to the grammar structures being used. The bottom part of the rubric applies to their response to their classmates. So again, we've got a discussion board conversation. We've got a Flipgrid video conversation. We have conversations occurring in the classroom. Another one that I'm going to be piloting this spring is something that if your students graduated from a United States high school, as 99% of the native English speakers did, and now a lot of the non-native English speakers did, this is a tool they've already used all the way through high school. My daughter is a, is a junior at UT in anthropology. She uses it in all of her courses there. It's called GroupMe. And GroupMe 
is basically a texting chat function, but it's a closed group that you moderate for a very specific purpose. And it's an app that you download and they text back and forth on a specific subject. And unlike a discussion board where you can remove a post, you can't remove a post from GroupMe, although you can take a student out of the group. But once the task is finished, you can close the group down so it doesn't stay open indefinitely. And it looks like a really useful additional tool to get those students talking to each other outside of a classroom if you don't have enough time during your class time to build those groups. So I'm going to pilot that in one of my classes this fall, or this spring rather, and if it works, then I'll take it to scale in the fall. So more to come on that one. So to build off of uh, what Mary Elizabeth was saying there, especially when we're looking at these rubrics, mine is going to have an example in just a second, is it really helps when we communicate our expectations. It creates reciprocal conversations throughout the semester, but specifically also when it activates prior knowledge and new content areas, focuses on content relevance, and those assignments and teamwork activities are linked to those summative assessments. Um, and I'm gonna give an example of uh, exactly how I think that works, uh, all of those points together in, in the next couple slides. Um, uh, I will say this, using those online discussion also helps you monitor online activity and participation in your course. And you get to implement grading practices that support student success. And again, help remove those equity barriers. So this is from the uh, OER course that I have just created uh, through TVR. Um, this is a interest grabber, if you will. Uh, this is a little 10 to 15 minute exercise. I, am, I have a strict limit on these at the beginning of class, so it doesn't take too much time. Uh, to, to get the students thinking about the text in a way that means something to them or the topic, if you don't like the word text. Um, so in this particular case, we are discussing Don Quixote. And I have them watch this video on the placebo effect. We'll make you guys watch it. I assume everyone knows what the placebo effect is. Uh, but then I pose this question to them. What does the placebo effect demonstrate about the power of belief? They write down their independent answers. We move into small groups. And then I ask them to analyze and apply their specific answer about belief to a section of Don Quixote. So they're taking this idea about belief that they've come up with all on their own that is their own, and they're then using it to help translate uh, the text that we're working with. Again. And in relation to transparency, I try to then extend that discussion into our online discussion boards. A little note on transparency though, what I did to make sure that this was equitable and transparent for my students is A, I put the rubric uh, section right up in the toolbar so that they can see it, click on it and see every rubric that I use throughout the semester and exactly what is needed. On the left over here, you'll also see that's my rubric for the discussion. One thing that I did that is a little bit different from Mary Elizabeth's is I weight the responses so that the responses they give to other students are worth more points than their actual post. To me, what this does is it specifically engenders conversation because they have to, they're more worried about responding to other students than they are about posting their own post um, because it gives more points. Um, it requires them to respond to three, uh, uh, sorry, three students, uh, three other students other than themselves uh, to get those full points. Yep. And then to extend that even further, uh, I have my online discussion that, that I use that rubric for. This is not asking them to analyze the text again. We've already done that in class. It does use the text and what we discussed in class as the jumping off point. But then I specifically ask them to extend their knowledge by asking students to engage with the text, but also their personal experience 
the replies are weighted more than their initial response. So they're actually reading more about other people's uh, personal experience and perspectives than their own. Um, and I know it's kind of hard to read, but you can see that question bolded down there at the bottom of that image where it says, what is more important, the idealism and imagination for change or the realism of seeing things as they are? And of course, they get to answer that however they want in relation to their own life and experience. <laughs> so, so, go ahead. Uh, one thing I didn't get to use there, but I, I, I'm also a big proponent of, is using exemplars. Uh, unfortunately, because I was piloting this course for the first time, I did not have any student exemplar work to use. Uh, and I was a little bit too caught up writing the course to write them myself. Um, but I will say that those exemplar examples give students the opportunity not only to interact with each other, but to interact with other student ideas and see what's expected of them. Those non-graded assignments uh, done in triads and dyads throughout the semester help build that community and it helps give them practice in assessing their own work. It provides multiple opportunities to earn course points um, throughout the semester. So not only are they earning points by doing the actual coursework in class, but they're also earning points for just talking about how this is related to their own lives outside of class too. Um, and it gives us opportunities to use feedback and improve performance in really low stakes way. Um, those online rubrics uh, uh, for students to examine on their own, uh, to examine on their own help their performance. Uh, and that even came from some of my students themselves telling me, hey, I never got to see the rubrics before I took stuff before. I really appreciate that. It helped me write it. Um, and then using those interactive online tools that Mary Elizabeth has uh, outlined for us are also very effective. Now we're going to turn this over to you and we're going to open this up as a group talk time. So what we'd like to know are what are the, some of the things that work for you? What are some ideas that you have to share? And what of these ideas do you think need further development for your own specific context? So I'm going to stop this share right now so that we can talk. So where are you in this process? Christy, you're on mute. Sorry, one of the things that works for me is I actually made a virtual escape room for my students to go through together in a group and to try to escape out of that through various questions. Um, and I found that playing a game together made them feel better. That's a great idea. I'm gonna put that yeah. out there. Very cool idea. I will, I think discovery learning is one of the most effective things, Christy. So I 100% agree. I'm so maybe. What did you do that through? I actually. Instruction wants to do make one of their own. I'm afraid I missed that. Could you say that one more time for me, please? Have all the wants to know frozen. how to do it. There she's back. Sorry. I'm <laughs> um, I, I did it through Google Docs. And I have all those instructions if you need it. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be great. That is wonderful. All right, that's a great idea. What else? So has have other members of our group used some of these tools? And if you have, have they worked? Or what? in what ways have you used them? Has anyone used Kahoot? 
So I have used Kahoot. Um, it's been a few semesters now since I've utilized it because I had it embedded in my PowerPoints or my discussions uh, in class. Um, because prior to that, I had like an in-classroom like clicker set. And so I just switched it over to Kahoot and would use it to try and get students engaged. And um, I've tried it different ways where I broke them down into groups of four and like whatever group had the most points at the end of class got like a bonus point or something. And then I've done it individually as well um, with Kahoot and then just anonymously. But I find that if they're, I know they need to be intrinsically motivated, but they are very extrinsically motivated for bonus points. Um, so they like um, those bonus point opportunities. And I've also used Remind, which is similar to GroupMe, but it was a way that I could communicate with students and they could respond back to me. This was pre-COVID where I wasn't giving my phone number out to the world, um, but that way they had another way to contact me without me giving them my personal information, but I could send out reminders and things. I think my daughter's orchestra teacher used that as well. Now with Remind, can they talk to each other and back to you? Is that just one direction? It, it depends how you set it up. You can set mm -hmm. it up so it's just you and them or that they could talk to each other also. Um, you just it, it was very easy set up and I found that my students liked the Remind as well. And I use the Kahoot also. Agree, bonus points uh, seem to be helpful and they do like to do it also in, in the teams. The other thing I do, or I did last semester, it takes a little bit of setup, but I did stations around the room and I can do this because I'm usually always in the same classroom and no one else is in there. Um, but I had each station was like a different activity um, you know, I brought in newspapers and they had to work together to find all of the facts they could on the page. And then they totaled up how many they found in each group and it was a little bit of a contest. Or um, I had a, a station of literally magazines and they had to cut out uh, persuasive examples of persuasive text. I'm trying to think. And then one of them was just like a worksheet, but they could work on it together and they all had to put their names on it and solve like the questions together. So I had four or five stations like that and it made the class, it the class went really fast and I was just bopping around, but I didn't really have much to do because they were very in it. And they had about 10 minutes at each, each station. I wish I had done that earlier in the semester. I waited until after the midway point and I realized how useful that was in building some relationships to, to people that hadn't interacted before. Great, great. All of these are wonderful ideas. Um, Something I'll add for Remind, if that's okay. Sure. Is with Remind, they could sign up with their email. I've had a student previously that did not have a cell phone. I don't know if GroupMe will let you just do it through like your email, but Remind also allows students just to get the email notifications and they can also respond through their email to the Remind. I was going to say, does anybody know any other differences in Remind and Group Me? Because I definitely want to try one of them this semester. Just wondering which one to do. Uh, I Sarah, would, go ahead. Sarah says that you can use Group Me on a web browser. So I think that would be a yes, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, I would add, I, I agree with discussions as far as um, giving them points or showing the value of responding to classmates. So it's part of the rubric on our discussion post uh, it, that you have to respond to two classmates and you get points for doing that. So I definitely saw a difference in interaction <laughs> when once those points were assigned for that specifically, and they can see it on the rubric, it clearly states points for responding to classmates. I will say in relation to that, um, I definitely agree that there's this uh, extrinsic modifier that comes with uh, the extra points definitely gets students to start doing it. But I found that 
I'll put this one other point out there for discussions because I really do think they can be effective is when I allowed the space for them to say, talk about their things they wanted to talk about too, to bring their lives into it. Like, you know, well, what's your favorite podcast that you would recommend for me to learn more about that? Or what, what band would that be? That kind of thing. The intrinsic motivation really started to come out because then they wanted to, they wanted to tell people about the stuff they knew. They wanted to share the things they thought were important and relevant. Um, so I think that's, if you're, if there is a struggle with the discussions, I think that might be uh, a way to build the intrinsic motivation through it. Uh, Dale, I do not. Um, that, that's part of the reason I wanted to be here today is I, I don't use very many tools outside of the LMS. I really do try to leverage as much inside of D2L as I can and as much inside of Zoom as I can. Um, so for instance, I actually use the Zoom polls uh, uh, in my classes, which allows them to answer anonymously. It does require some pre-planning where I have to type up the questions and have them ready, uh, but that that is the way that I prefer to do it. So um, I wouldn't get too caught up on like which of the programs that you're using, more of uh, what's the motivation and how's it gonna increase student activity. Audrey, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I made a low tech version of an escape room and I just thought I would share it just in case anybody else wanted to do this. But um, I just made, um, you know, four activities that they had to complete. One of them was like, they had to take one of the online quizzes. And the second one was they had to do a page out of the book and, um, you know, a couple of other things. And I just gave everybody a note card when they came into class. And I said, this is your exit ticket. This is how you get out of class today. And then I had different colored pens. And when they would complete number one, I gave them a green check mark. And when they would complete number two, they got a purple one. And uh, once they got all four check marks, they could give that to me and leave class for the day. Um, so it was very low tech. I, I didn't, you know, use any other technology, but um, they loved it and they thought it was really fun and they had a good time with it. So, um, and the ones that got done early, of course, loved leaving early. So, um, but I thought it was really effective. Oh, that's a great idea. This is kind of off in the weeds and I'm not sure how effective it will be for anybody, but I will say this for my 8 a.m. class, I told them if they, for any, for the weeks where they brought all their work on Tuesdays, I would bring coffee on Thursdays and it definitely improved the amount of work I got. <laughs> it, only, it only cost me a $12 for a Joe to go. So I figured I drink it too. So. Well, we'll, we'll work for food and drink, right? You'd be surprised how far candy rewards go to though. These are wonderful ideas. Any other suggestions? Something I do that I tried for the first time last semester that is no tech whatsoever. Um, and it did require more work on my end. So that's something I'm considering for this semester. But for the first day of class, I had my students help me create our schedule. How many exams do you wanna have? Here's how many chapters we have to cover. I teach AMP. So like, it's pretty cut and dry. I'm teaching like 12 chapters this semester that we have to cover them. How many chapters do you want on your exam? Would you rather have more exams? with less content or would you rather have you know fewer exams with larger quantities of content um, and then I even had them help me decide when we wanted those exams to be I mean I realistically guided that conversation you know if they were like oh the first test should be next week and I'm like no we can't cover three chapters in three days that's not going to happen you know um, but to realistically keep it spaced and I think I felt like I had more buy-in from the students and the feedback I got from them suggested that they felt like they had more ownership over their class because they got to make some of those big piece decisions that really significantly impact them, you know, because it's their schedule. 
Yeah, I, I will second that, Rachel. Autonomy, definitely, when you give them a sense that they are in the part of the decision-making process, it changes things. Um, I did not do exactly what you did, but in my English 1010, I use a portfolio system. So at the end of the semester, they get to choose which essays I grade. Um, so that I give them that choice first. The other thing I did in my literature class that really got me some credit and buy him was I asked them to list for me when all their other exams were in their other classes. And then we pick dates between those for their assignments to be due. Um, and that, that went a long way. These are wonderful, wonderful ideas. All right. Wow, this is terrific. Any other thoughts, ideas, suggestions? We can move on to another board. This is super. Okay, so here's what we're going to, oh wait, something else in the chat. Great, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, let me pull up another screen right quick. All right, so we're gonna do one more Slido poll, I think. So let me pull this up. So one more, I'm gonna share it. So same idea, but this time the question is, what is something from this presentation that you would like to explain or further. And this is something that either one of your colleagues, we might be able to convince to do his or her own teaching center presentation, hint, hint, hint. Or if it's something that either Robert and I talked about that you would be interested in us presenting again or in further depth, we would be happy to do as well. So tell us, what is something you'd like for us to take further from this presentation? Looks like there's definitely one clear winner. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we definitely have a future presentation on classroom games and on discussions because that one's coming up a lot. So it looks like we've got definitely something coming up on discussion boards and classroom games. And that classroom games is going to include escape rooms. So my escape room folks, I see something future in our, uh, something coming up in our future. All right, so Robert, if you would be so kind as to put that um, link in the chat. Have a look.
That's so I've uh, placed the link in the chat. That's a survey for us. Along with this last uh, poll here, this helps us just know uh, what you thought, what you liked, uh, where you want us to go in the future. So it definitely helps us if you fill those out. I um, think we got a clear indication of what we need to work on, classroom games. I mean, if you'd have told me five years ago that people would be so uh, open to gamification, which is something that I got pushed back on so hard before, uh, I would not have believed you. But a whole I like new world, a whole new world. It's changing, man. Yeah. So we are happy to leave the um, Zoom open for the next few minutes if you'd like to chat further. But let me just say for now, thank you all so much for coming and taking time out of your Friday afternoon to join us. We really appreciate it. Um, we will definitely look at a future presentation on gamification and escape room folks. We will be talking to you again. Um, and Robert with his discussion.